All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Raymond with WCET. Thank you so much for joining us for another post-conference session. We have one more next week. We're really excited about this conversation today. Moving from digital learning to AI, harnessing data to promote equity and improve student outcomes. We have two chat options, one on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for our speakers today, we'd like to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose. But we'll be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session today by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. We do hope that this is interactive. To help our moderator, if you're asking a question in the chat, please use a question mark at the beginning of the question. And this makes it easier for us to sort through and keep track of those questions. We have a great moderator today and he'll take it from here. His name is Robert Prez. He's a good friend of WCET's. He's the Senior Manager of Business Operations and Strategic Ini Initiatives for Every Learner Everywhere. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, very happy to be here. Uh, it's my honor to, uh, to introduce uh, our two speakers uh, this afternoon, uh, Justin Dellinger and George Siemens. Um, we'll start with Justin. He's the Learning Analytics Program coordinator in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, before that, he served as associate director for the Learning Innovation and Network Knowledge Research Lab in the Center for Research on Teaching and Learning Excellence at uh, UT Arlington. And his research interests include learning analytics, adoption and policy, organizational leadership, teamwork, and multiple pathways, learn learn and multiple pathways learning. Uh, he has experience teaching K-12 levels, uh, university, and open online courses, and also serves as co-lead with the Digital Learning Research Network and Learning Analytics Learning Network, uh, DLEARN, uh, which is also a partner of the Every Learner Everywhere Network I'll mention. Uh, George Siemens researches how human and artificial cognition intersect in knowledge processes. He co-leads the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning, uh, C3L, at the University of South Australia and is a professor at the University of Texas Arlington, along with Justin. Uh, he is the founding president of the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and he has advised government agencies in Australia, the European Union, uh, Canada, and in the US, as well as numerous international universities on digital learning and utilizing learning analytics for assessing and evaluating productivity gains in the education sector and improving learner results. In 2008, he pioneered massive open online courses, uh, commonly known as MOOCs. Uh, they are here today to talk about how to move from digital learning to AI, harnessing data to promote equity and improve student outcomes. And with that, uh, I'll let the presentation begin. Take it away, George and Justin. Great, thanks, Robert. And uh, thanks to the, the crew at WCET for this opportunity to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about it, an area that I think is gonna be of critical importance going forward. Uh, while there is a bit uh, high on the hype meter right now, I think it's one of those technologies that over time is going to have uh, at least as dramatic, if not more dramatic impact than even some of the most aggressive pundits are proclaiming. What we're going to talk about is essentially five key areas, um, uh, basically how we got from digital through to artificial intelligence, how this relates to some aspects of digital learning, what's actually practically being done with AI in learning settings, and I'll just provide a really simple three sort of stage framework and then talk a little bit about some of those illustrations. Then Justin's gonna uh, take over and look specifically at what does this mean from an equity perspective? And then I'll uh, wrap up and talk a little bit about just how AI in these instances might support or promote more effective outcomes for students and uh, what that might mean in the long run. So first of all, uh, what's actually happening in this space? How do we move from this idea of we're in a digital world to all of a sudden everything is about artificial intelligence? And from my lens, it's a pretty simple framework. And it's one that we've had for, well, a number of years now or decades, actually. And that's basically if it's digital, it produces data. And that's really what the impetus was for learning analytics as a field, because once you have data, you have analytics. And this was the case around 2009 uh, when I sent an invite out to a group of researchers, uh, colleagues from around the world. And I said, you know, are you interested in exploring what can we do with data to better understand learning and learning processes? And this ended up in the first learning analytics conference in Banff in uh, 2011 and uh, eventually the formation of uh, the Society for Learning Analytics Research, which is now the largest 
uh, learning analytics organization globally. And I'm not sure, Justin, if you have a second to drop a URL into, into the chat in case anyone's not familiar with, with the organization. Uh, all of our academic proceedings are published uh, open source as of a couple of years ago now. So you'll be able to access and look at some of the literature and the resources that have been collected in that particular domain. But the, um, the development of this really is that simple model. Um, once you have the data of analytics, and then now we're starting to see an emergence of, with enough data and enough advanced analytics processes, you start to get into the domain of AI. And I'll talk a little bit about what AI is shortly, but essentially it's the reality that when you're dealing with huge quantities of data, and I think this is really the fundamental attribute of our era is really information overload. We can no longer manage or apprehend or interact with or govern information the way that we've perhaps done in the past. You know, and, and nothing is more uh, sort of representative of that than what's happened around things like the library classification system, which for a long time, even though it was quite biased, was a means for Western countries or Western civilization to categorize its knowledge. Uh, it certainly didn't take long with the rise of the internet and that categorization scheme very quickly became obsolete. Uh, so there's a couple of little thoughts here. You know, one is this idea that more is different. Um, I believe it was Anderson that made that statement back in 1970. So when you have more of something, you need to interact with it differently. Or David Galanter, who's a, a computer prof, had said, you know, if you have three dogs, give them a name. But if you have 10,000 head of cattle, don't bother. So the outcome being essentially just proclaiming that as something grows in scope and size, the mechanisms that we use to manage at a smaller scale are no longer applicable and we need to start trying to do different things. So if you look at the types of data that are now being collected, and this is on likely whether you represent a school or a corporate environment or whether you're coming out from a university lens, this is likely a sampling of what you have available working with your students pending, of course, the appropriate IRB or institutional clearance requirements. But, you know, the student information systems, which give us a lot of demographic background, campus attendance, academic data, the learning environment, which is everything related to what they're doing when they're in either you know, Brightspace or Blackboard or Canvas or a, a similar type of uh, technology. If they're using intelligent tutoring systems, that'll also fit within that space and really anything related to context and access whether they're coming out from a mobile or other, other type of technology. The library classification, especially around eBooks or uh, resource utilization is another uh, approach. And then on the top right, the instrumentation, which is underdeployed because we haven't done a lot of the, trying to build effective models in the learning space in the same way that we perhaps have done in the past. And by in the past, I mean the proverbial big five as psychological profiles and so on. Uh, we did a couple of projects with Boeing and MIT to try and flesh out and develop some of these profiles and get a sense of does, for lack of a better word, who we are impact how well we do in courses, meaning if we have a certain approach to openness, a certain approach to engagement, will that determine how well we do in various academic settings? So these are more focused instruments. And Jess and I recently coordinated an event, actually just last week, where we looked at psychology and learning analytics, trying to identify what is it that we need to do a better job of with um, building models based on data rather than just using data post uh, student learning, it's intentional experimental design approaches. And then of course, a number of things that are a little more specialized, multimodal or psychophysiological data where we're dealing with wearable devices and so on as part of our overall framework that we use for, for learner uh, profile development. And then uh, lastly, social media, which is a little more hyped and useful in educational settings in some ways, unless you've centrally developed Twitter or Facebook as part of your key course environment. And then a number of other things that could be tied into library management systems or could be third party. And the third party list is growing very rapidly especially in the space of AI. So we're getting a mess of data. And this rather large quantity of data that we have access to and that we're using with our students in various settings is starting to improve, you know, impact how we're thinking about what's capable in educational settings. The privacy concerns and some of the constraints regarding ethics are really substantial, but they're late in getting explored. We spent a lot of time doing what we could with data. And this is not just representative of education. This is, you know, Facebook and Twitter and every major social media company. But we spent a lot of time working with data before we actually started to look at what does this mean or what are the implications, at least at a broad level. There have always been voices that are saying, hey, what are you guys doing? This isn't, uh, this isn't kosher. We need to make some changes or make some, uh, you know, regulations on how this is managed. 
so let me flip, and this is sort of a slightly longer section of the sections I'll talk about this is, is the, I think the longest, but I want to look a little bit about, you know, the idea of AI as it relates to digital learning and what that actually might mean. And so one of the aspects here is, if we're talking about AI, all of you that have been in the university or the school sector, you, you've dealt with one new technology after another. You've heard this will change everything. Some of you may recall Second Life, which has now been rebranded as the metaverse. Um, you've heard examples of how this is going to change this part of, of education or the you know, tablets will change that or one laptop per child at a, at a secondary or K-12 level will make these and these changes. So we've heard a lot about different technologies that are going to change absolutely everything. And so the question becomes, I think, quite prudently, well, you know, how is this idea of AI that different from any of the other technologies that we've seen sort of come on the horizon, or certainly over the last 20 years when we've had this massive explosion in tools and tool sets. And I think one of the realities is that we are now in a world where humans and machines think together. All of us have experienced this, you know, even this morning or even this afternoon, as you made your way through the day, as you interacted with people online, you were maybe not consciously, but you were thinking with a technology agent. Uh, we weren't using it the way we might pick up a hammer and use it in this sense, um, somewhere in the domain of McLuhan-esque uh, type of perspectives, the technology was using us, if you will, as much as we were using it. And I think this is something that gets at the heart of the reality that, you know, if more technology creates problems that only more technology can solve. So, you know, we have these fascinating tools that allow us to connect and interact globally, but unfortunately that creates a secondary effect, which is incredible information overload. We can't make sense of everything that we're doing. There's active manipulation of those kinds of information structures globally, yeah, misinformation, disinformation campaigns. And so in order to combat that, we turn, not surprisingly, to more technology to help us make sense of it. And so that's where the AI comes in as a second generation supporting technology in that regard that becomes more than, like I said, a, a, an application like Microsoft Word that we use for a purpose. We have a co-use relationship with AI that uh, we may not always be sort of fully aware of it. And this is going to be, you know, toward the end of the section, this will be the question I'll sort of direct for you to reflect on in the chat. But the question is, you know, what is what is that's unique to being human in this space, right? If, you know, if we're, we're no longer just competing cognitively with one another or with other uh, countries or regions, we're now engaged in sort of a, a learning frenzy where an AI system in some ways is a co-learner that influences and develops us or directs our actions quite actively. And so then bef before we keep running down this pathway a little bit, it might be helpful to just start and say, what is it that we're talking about when we have this idea of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, or neural, network, uh, neural networks as part of it? Well, broadly speaking, the, the uh, term AI is basically making intelligent machines. And there's often, it can be include more of a robotics end in some cases, uh, work that's done on a factory floor. The big vision initially uh, was that we would achieve something like general AI, which means it's on par with human cognition, which is domain transferable, right? If we learn something in one domain, we can transfer it to another domain. Whereas many AI systems are narrow intelligence, meaning that they've acquired certain skill sets and they succeed in those skill sets. But if you take a system that's been trained to play chess or go, and you ask it to look at medical data, it, it's not useful because it is a very narrow domain of expertise. Machine learning, which I think in many cases is, is the area that many of us experience most frequently uh, comes from this, or has this definition of the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So we like to say that through supervised or unsupervised or some flavor and variations of that, uh, we end up with the machine learning. So we can learn how to classify email as spam versus actual email might be able to learn how to identify cancer images in certain types of uh, medical images and so on. And then the final one, which in many ways is where a lot of the hype and the activity is coming from, at least the big proclamations of what the future of our world will look like, fits into this domain of neural networks or deep learning. And that takes almost a human cognition model in terms of uh, you know, network neurons that have networks that parse things and produce certain outputs. Um, one image that, that I found useful just as a quick illustration of what this looks like is, is from IBM. 
uh, recently, which is you have this idea that you've got um, you know, set of Russian nesting dolls almost, where it's artificial intelligence is the umbrella in which machine learning and neural network and deep uh, learning exists. And so these are, in some ways, AI is a broad sweeping umbrella term, much like we would say a computer is a broad sweeping term for things like doing email and using a, a word processor or, or, or seeing it in a Zoom session. Now, the um, uh, question then in a practical way, what is it that AI actually does? And what is it capable of doing? And AI writ large, so I'm using it in a generic sense. So in some cases, in some cases, these will be very distinct or specific kinds of activities that AI will be doing. But it can recognize images, image signs, it can speak. Um, in fact, some of the work in language, and we have a good colleague uh, at University of Texas Arlington, Pete Smith, that is deeply focused in the AI, NLP, linguistic uh, kinds of domains and the effect that it has, because everything from translation in terms of speech to actual translation of text and so on is an area where AI has been exceptionally successful. Within educational or scientific settings, it can identify patterns in data that humans through their models of research haven't been able to uh, achieve or identify. You know, AI can succeed at complex strategy games such as Go, chess, or other uh, types of even multiplayer games online where uh, AI systems are able to compete with and defeat human teams uh, in this environment as well. Some of the areas that's gotten a lot of attention is AI as uh, self-driving cars or supporting self-driving cars and what that looks like. Um, it's obviously in very constrained situations typically, but nonetheless, that's an area where AI probably has received a large chunk of its hype. And then a number of things practically, tumors and medical images, recognizing faces, even though some of you may have seen uh, Google's proclamation that they want to sort of move away or delete their face recognition data set. Uh, even though in some regions of the world it's incredibly effective. Now, a number of years ago, I think it was a BBC production that uh, went to, I believe it was Beijing, and the individual was tasking sort of the Beijing police with, can you find me uh, through this system of public surveillance? And, and so he was given a head start to you know, make his way or hide or move around the city and to see how long would it take for the uh, law enforcement or the, this particular experiment, perhaps not so much law enforcement, but for him to be found. And it was an incredibly short period of time. I think it was something like 30 minutes, uh, even though he was given a head start to make his way wherever he wanted to around the city, but they quickly uh, found him due to this vast, uh, vast network of cameras and images where they quickly found where he was. Um, additionally, there are some creative capabilities with AI, developing recipes, developing music. Uh, AI and music has been an interesting area of overlap over the last while as well. But broadly speaking, then, we have this concept that AI does do very well when it deals with things like structured, computation heavy, or rules bounded activities. It doesn't do as well with fuzzy uh, logic, even though there is a subdomain of that, but as, as we do as humans, because we have this incredible domain transferability from one area to the next. And so AI requires significant structures to be most effective. Now in learning, AI has more promise than exhibited reality to date, but there's some caveats here because these uh, hurdles can sometimes be cleared very quickly. A lot of it's hype, and a lot of it seems to be more about positioning for future success. So UNESCO released a report actually just yesterday on you know, AI and the future of AI. The European Union had a major report in 2018 that addressed this. I think pretty much every major tech company has an AI and learning uh, sort of white paper, every major uh, consulting firm has an AI policy document related to learning and so on. So there's a tremendous amount of attention on the, the future preparedness of AI in various learning settings. Um, AI can do a lot, and I'll give you a couple, you know, sort of three chunk list shortly, but, uh, you know, after Justin's talked, but around the uh, support for administration of learning, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that AI can do uh, to, to support institutional university school practices. Largely, though, it's uh, really a focus of automating methods and approaches to the learning process, and it has to date not focused on student success at the same level that where I think it needs to be and where I think it will be heading over time. Now, I just want to take a small detour and talk about a few things quickly that will have implications for us in the education setting in the long run. So there's a paper from 2019 that looked at this idea of machine behavior, that as we start to see 
machines and machines, uh, we're not talking about robots necessarily, we can be talking about algorithms, but as these systems interact with one another, there is this intersection where the machine behavior will become its own research domain, where we're understanding how does an individual machine or algorithm act and how does it change or act as it moves into a broader network of you know a network of teams or teams of machines if you will and how ultimately does that impact with human beings and human being performance so a lot of team-based work in a corporate setting for example could have quite a substantive effect or substantive influence from this particular kind of an output namely how technologies interact and produce varying outcomes and the reason this is particularly important and i would say the integration of human and artificial cognition is going to be a substantive challenge for us as well, I guess, as an entire species. Um, there is an article, and this is now almost a decade ago, uh, this was looking at some of the aspects within the, the uh, stock trading or the financial markets where things can happen really quickly and humans are often not able to interact or to interfere, if you will. So the final line here is gold in my eyes, is that there is a new behavioral regime where we as humans lose the ability to intervene in real time. And it's not just in financial markets, it's also the case in a number of other settings, including obviously military settings and so on. So we are working with machines in such a way that they're outpacing our ability to be meaningful and substantive controlling agents. So in some ways that has kind of sailed that ship proverbially. What it looks like, though, just to understand how I'm putting these two pieces together. So specifically, I'm emphasizing cognition as a distinct subset, and, and that's much of our, our work and our interest. So there's uh, projects that Justin and I have initiated at the University of Texas. There's uh, projects that colleagues and I have initiated at the University of South Australia that look specifically at this idea of human and artificial cognition. So at a broad level, artificial cognition within the AI domain uh, is basic research on algorithms and computational models, neural networks, all the things we just talked about. From a cognitive science perspective, neuroscience and cognitive processes, philosophy of mind and so on, there's also basic activities that are involved when individuals learn or when they're involved in learning in these kinds of settings. And so as a result of these sorts of outcomes or these sorts of uh, factors, we're really interested in where that overlaps, where a human being thinking as a team or an individual interacts with an artificial system also thinking, whether individual or in team, does something together, whether it's task allocation, whether it's active engagement or something comparable that comes out as a result of that. And so that's the domain of research or the domain of interest that in many ways, um, you know, I, I would say are, you know, are the most provocative or the most interesting from, from my end. Now, this fits into something that's literally being called the FITS list. This lets you know just how long ago this has been a, a set of topics or a set of discussion within the various domains from the really the earliest point where we started seeing the indication that machines could be something like cognitive work. People have been trying to say what's unique to humans, which is actually the, the work, the shared activity on the next slide, uh, what's unique to humans and what's unique to the technology agents. And so, you know, this is going back to the 1950s, which is, you know, can humans do well and what can machines do well? And quite often it's, you know, machines can do repetitive routine tasks. They can store information. Uh, they can, which most of this is considering this was a hundred or 50 years ago, I should say, uh, this is, in this list is in some ways quite obsolete because machines can do much, much more than they were doing at this time. But nonetheless, it gets at sort of the core issue or the core challenge here. So what I'm going to do now is stop sharing the slides and I'm going to ask you to spend a bit of time, which is the question that I have on my next slide is, you know, when you think of some of these things, uh, you know, in terms of the effects and the changes and so on, what is it that remains a unique domain for humans? What is it that you think is a uniquely human attribute that so far technology or AI specifically hasn't had a chance to challenge or to at least overcome? So two ways to do this, obviously, I encourage you to respond in the text area, or if you'd like to grab the mic, just raise your hand and we will find you. Okay, just seeing a couple of comments. Yeah, emotion as it relates to learning and motivation. Yep, absolutely. 
uh, empathy, faith, spirituality, also a great one. I think it was actually, I think the Southern Baptist group listed a set of principles with the Southern Evangelical group. I'll have to find it, but they listed a set of principles on AI and faith. So uh, certainly uh, religious organizations are not ignoring the advancements of AI and AI as, as an intelligent entity, so to speak. Okay. Other thoughts? What's unique? Storytelling, Ryan, that's a great one as well. There's a and I think narrative and storytelling is in some ways almost the most human of processes, right? We, we engage in, uh, in a number of areas that, that that's a particularly pronounced or a particularly consequential kind of an output. Um, yeah, that was one. Uh, so I'm looking at a few other ones. Um, da -da -da -da, any other aspects? Moral reasoning. Uh, okay, what else? Um, yeah, Stephen, I think for moral reasoning, that's a big one. I was reading an article the other day about a prof who said, what we don't know with AI, and this is one of the interesting things with AI in, in, in general, um, which is that it, it's, if we give AI a mission, it may achieve it in ways that we haven't anticipated. So uh, the illustration of this computer science prof gave was, well, if we told uh, AI cure cancer, now, a fully reasonable approach for AI to take is to do large scale control trials or A-B testing where you, inf you know, find a way to infect all of humanity with uh, or, or give them cancer and then find different ways to uh, solve that at scale with 7 billion people or so on. So I think you know, the illustration in that case was an interesting output, which is if we give AI uh, the opportunity to develop or to uh, you know, have full autonomy, it'll solve problems, but it will solve them in ways that might be very damaging to us. The same thing with climate change, uh, which is it could go out and say, uh, you know, we need AI to solve climate change and AI's response might be, hmm, what's the one deciding factor that contributes to climate change and determine it's humans and that's the group that perhaps needs to be uh, eradicated, if you will. So I think that's where, the, where moral reasoning, uh, sort of go off a side pathway there, where moral reasoning is, is such a critical concept. All right, so, and I think these are the kinds of things that you've probably heard from different groups like uh, World Economic Forum and others that have gone out and they've tried to say, you know, what are future job skills? What are some of the things that we're gonna need in the long run? And overwhelmingly, those are the kinds of skills that you've mentioned um, they, they, that relate to creativity or that relate to uh, interacting with other people that relate to the emotion, the affect and so on. Uh, so that starts to become critical in that space. Um, but when we apply this, and this is just a couple of quick slides here before I throw it over to Justin, when we apply this in education settings, a number of important questions arise. You know, that's great. So we have AI that does some discrete things, but we have humans that need to do other things. And getting that balance right is not an inconsequential challenge or an inconsequential uh, um, task uh, for us to focus on. And so I'm going to argue that there's really three primary areas that we need to think about AI or AI functioning. Uh, the first is related to content and learning activities. And if you look at, especially the content end of it, there are a number of organizations you may recall. At one point, uh, there was Newton with a K that was huge around personalized learning for a period. Smart Sparrow uh, was another one uh, that's significant in that space. There's Cogbooks and other illustrations of, of uh, services that address sort of the content space or learning activities. Uh, Carnegie Mellon's, uh, you know, work around uh, or, or CMU's uh, work with adaptive learning fits into this same category as well. And it's some level of how an AI agent supports how a learner moves through a predefined set of curriculum. Uh, one of the projects that we have a colleague out of uh, University of South Australia, Vidimir Kovanovich, focusing on is the idea of uh, learner profiles, meaning, and I, I would say in some cases, it's probably the single biggest unresolved issue in the education space is the development of sustained and persistent profiles of our students. Something that will sort of work through prior learning assessments, something that will work through from being in the corporate sector back to the labor market, something that'll help transition from high school to university and so on. So profiles are, are sort of a critical area and that's something that, that uh, you know, Vita is working on, especially at, in, the, in the Australian setting, at least in the K to 12 sector. Another aspect of, of AI and AI interventions is around uh, learner agency and uh, teaching support. 
Uh, one project that was led by a colleague, Abelardo Pardo, focused on uh, adaptive learning through a system called OnTask. And I think if you go to ontasklearning.org, it's you know free software that you can download, and it provides sort of adaptive feedback to students. Now, some of these uh, kinds of interventions uh, range from being fairly easy to implement to being fairly complex to implement. So, for example, with OnTask, you have to plan your curriculum well, lay out your curriculum clearly, and then start to deploy that curriculum in, in a way that requires significant advanced planning in order for you to effectively use adaptive feedback in your teaching and learning. Um, other aspects, which relates to number three as well, but is intervention. So if, let's say, in your third area, you're working with a major uh, learning analytics or some similar provider that's helping you work through data or dealing with student success, you'll most likely have predictive models at the core of it. And those predictive models will often start out by trying to identify what student population or which individual students is most at risk of dropping out or which student is signaling or starting to indicate a challenging prospect of no longer being able to to sort of successfully uh, complete a particular course or a particular program. And so this is where interventions start to rise and interact with the administrative organizational support, namely the predictive models and student support that you want to build on top of that. So I'll argue that these, for now at least, are the primary domains where we're going to see significant AI influence around content and learning activities and the learning process, around learner agency and teaching support, and around administration and organizational support. And if you look at most AI initiatives, they'll typically fit in one of these three buckets. Justin. Thank you, George. All right. Uh, definitely some great thought for stuff so far, George. Um, we we'll continue the conversation here um, as it relates to, um, to equity. So over the past five years, uh, there's been a significant increase in conversations as they relate to things like algorithms, um, bias, ethics, privacy, equity, and the like. Um, we live in a post-Cambridge analytical world now, right? Um, it's like that was forever ago sometimes. <laughs> um, and uh, people are a lot more aware of data and algorithms, whether in K-12, post-secondary education, as well as society at large. Um, more aware, but not necessarily everybody has this kind of awareness. Um, this awareness has definitely been evidenced in, in popular media, as well as uh, educational organizations, uh, such as, as you see Lindsay Downs, WCET post in the, the bottom right down there, um, algorithms, diversity, privacy, better data practices to create greater student equity. Um, so things like that as well, um, a lesser area, um, an area that's been less explored um, that has gained um, some uh, more attention, I'd say recently, is definitely around student voice too and student perceptions around um, data, um, their use, and things like learning analytics, uh, participatory co-design is also um, a big area too among faculty and, and students. Um, just drop a couple things in here if you're interested in any of that. Um, so I'll go ahead and invite, advance the next slide, George. So um, of course, there's been a corresponding uh, increase in equity related research as well. So some of the examples that I put up here are from learning analytics, uh, the field of learning analytics. Um, this includes focusing um, on learning um, in learning analytics over what we consider like data analytics. Um, and there's been some, some good work in, in that space as well. And I had a, um, the joy of presenting um, on this topic at the WCT 2019 event with Karen Vignari at APLU. Um, so that was great. And um, there are definitely some challenges at different levels um, with competing interests, right? So you think about you know, how we use AI or how we use learning analytics or just being able to make use of any sort of granular learning data at the classroom level, the program level, departments, colleges, upper administration, uh, institutional effectiveness and research. There's all these different groups that have perhaps competing um, uh, competing goals for how data is is used at an institution. Who has access to it? The kinds of technologies that we procure and that are available to people, as well as the different dashboards in place that that students, staff, and faculty and others can see. Um, next slide, George. 
So there's been some great work in this space, in the equity space around digital learning by uh, every learner everywhere. I've had the joy of, of, of working on a number of different initiatives. Um, there have been some guides that have come out, such as the Getting Started with Equity Guide for Academic Department Leaders uh, that came out um, earlier this year. Um, different blog posts, um, as you see the adaptive learning, that one just uh, came up very recently, um, a day or two ago, um, as well as um, just uh, different um, educational technologies and learning experiences. Um, I had, um, uh, I got the opportunity to work with, with Kristen Fox and Aveline at uh, Titan Partners on a, on a Every Learner funded uh, project around um, equity-minded learning analytics. And we uh, were able to present that at the uh, Society for Learning Analytics Research um, annual conference, uh, Learning Analytics and Knowledge. Um, and we got some, some great feedback on that with some guiding principles for, um, for um, the adoption and implementation of learning analytics in institutions with really equity at the center of that. So um, I'll post that link in here. I actually forgot to, to grab that one. Um, but there's there's some there's some great work here. Um, you can go to uh, Solar's um, website if you. Um, I'll, I'll drop that in some later. But um, and this is the learning analytics strategy toolkit. Thanks, Megan, for dropping those in for us. Um, as well, um, I've even seen uh, some some recent work that's come out from Digital Promise about um, they have a certification that they're that they're and been working on on prioritizing racial equity in AI design too. So I wanted to drop that in here as well. Um, I'm all about resource sharing as much as possible. <laughs> Do this with my, with my students at the ETA, perhaps uh, over and inundate them with it, but I'd like them to be aware of the different conversations that are going on. Um, so yeah, uh, so what I wanted to do is, you know, I don't necessarily have all the answers here, definitely can say that I don't have all the answers here. So I wanna take the opportunity as, as George did to uh, pause and chat here and, and just thinking about your context and, and, and where you are working, um, whether you are supporting institutions or whether you're on the ground, boots on the ground um, as, a, as a faculty member or, or working, um, just had a couple of questions I wanna throw in here. So the first one is, um, so what do you see um, are the greatest opportunities and reasons for harnessing data, learning analytics, or artificial intelligence to promote equity, equity and improve student outcomes? So feel free to grab the mic if you want. There are only 39 of us in here right now. So um, definitely encourage conversation if you are wanting to do that. Or as uh, you did earlier with George's part, you can put it in the chat as well. Um, but in the spirit of, of the time that we have, it may be faster for you to grab the mic than type it. So George has definitely shared some, some great things so far. I was curious about your context and thinking of it through an equity lens. Okay. So we have personalizing pathways. Absolutely. Um, definitely. I had a recent publication on that, looking at some process mining, looking at um, offering instructivist and connectivist pathways in the same course, um, the ability for, um, for the learners to pick their path through. Um, there's some definitely some interesting, interesting uh, results that came out of that. Um, intervention, absolutely. So, so catching students along the way. Um, I know I had seen that in courses where you don't get the first grade until say, so you start a semester in late August and you get your first grade the second week of October. Uh, the drop deadline is the fourth week of October. Um, so you get your, you know, maybe a second test. So you're basically having to make a decision whether you're gonna drop a class based off of maybe one test um, at best two, um, things like that, um, especially in high DFW courses um, for our, um, for freshmen or, or sophomores in particular. So there's some things that we can do in um, early on in a course for sure. So part of that's the pedagogy of the way that you design your course and part of it's the tools and data that you use and collect. Okay, closing racial attainment gaps. Okay, um, predicting. Yeah, so, so different predictive models that we have. 
as well. And that kind of also goes to what George is talking about with their profiles too. Anything else? I don't know, I'll go to our next question, which is sort of the, maybe not the opposite, but so, so what are some of the greatest barriers or red flags that you see in your context around uh, harnessing data, analytics, and AI? Uh, there was another one that came in for the for the first one um, around uh, just some time tutoring um, and, and feedback too. Definitely, as George mentioned, we, we use tools like OnTask. Um, some great opportunities to to provide personalized feedback to students. <laughs> yeah, Stephen, where to start? Okay, so we have coding from different departments varies, multiple data gathering methods um, with different use of Likert variables. Or Likert, I don't know how you wanna say it, right? Uh, potential to select students from specific zip codes and exclude others. Lack of understanding of what to collect. What is actionable? Oh yeah, definitely. Lack of literacy about learning analytics, um, layman systems that can help bridge the gap between stakeholders, getting people to use the tools that collect the data. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, time and, and other reasons that, that get put out a lot for sure. Privacy protections may be at odds with granular analytics, absolutely. It's definitely becoming something that's um, more of an issue. I mean, we don't necessarily have the same sort of like GDPR challenges um, here in the U.S. as perhaps some of my European colleagues who who, uh, who have told me different conferences they wish them knows that they were based in the U.S. But um, I think that we're definitely moving more and more that direction in terms of you know privacy protections that are out there. Anything else? Okay, great. Well, I'll leave it there. Feel free to throw something else in the chat. Um, we're taking time here. It's um, we got 17 tilt. So George, I'll turn it back to you so we can wrap up the conversation. Okay, so um, the the equity question related to AI is, uh, is obviously a, a hugely consequential one. Um, and one of the reasons why, and this is something likely all aware of, most often the models that we use or the data that we use to build the models that classify, sort, organize, do whatever it is that we want an AI or machine learning model to do, they're typically backward facing. In fact, in some way, I think we call them predictive models, but really another flip side is to say the backward looking models because the predictions typically are at least with the early development of the models are based on uh, historical data. And, you know, you, your past actions as an individual, or it could be the past actions of groups of individuals or populations. And so what AI does in this regard and why the equity conversation is so consequential is because it's backward looking, it's taking data that's historical. In some cases it can be, you know, weeks, months, years, decades. And when we take that data and then we try to do something with it, and you've all heard examples of this, I'm sure, you know, Amazon has a sexist hiring bot that was developed and because it's taking historical data, uh, which the historical system has, you know, was sexist, it was racist, then that system produces or applies that template of decision making on top of new data. Now, of course, with over time, in a properly developed model, it will change and evolve and grow uh, if there's feedback systems built in. However, the moral of the story, I think, essentially is that when we have racist 
or sexist or similar types of bots or uh, AI systems, it's often because of they're being trained on data that has those attributes. So the equity conversation and you know some of the reports that Justin shared from you know the panel WCET uh, coordinated from the work of everyone or everywhere and from a growing number of uh, socially conscious researchers. Uh, this is a huge area of interest and some of you may have followed some of the work that's happened at Google where one of their AI uh, equity teams, if you will, ended up um, essentially disbanding or at least eliminating a number of the key researchers because they uh, there, there were some challenges which were cloaked or stated, this is with uh, Tim Nitkabru if you're familiar with this, but they were stated uh, as as uh, you know, related function of a paper that wasn't properly vetted, but there was a large view from from certain segments in the technology space that it was actually just because the the organizations like Google weren't quite prepared to confront directly uh, some of the issues that were being raised. You know, another researcher, uh, Emily Bender from University of Washington, who's been central in a lot of these conversations as well, really addresses this challenge of equity and this question of what is uh, fairness, what is bias, and which populations are being impacted and which are being you know, often very negatively impacted by some of the decisions that are being made. And so when it comes to questions of student outcomes, so here we've got this potentially huge, powerful technology, AI, and this is going to be impacted on three distinct levels. It's going to impact the learning content and the learning process. It's going to content learning and teaching practices, and it's going to impact the administrative processes that underpin all of it. So that's this potentially enormous opportunity through AI. Then you have this problem, which is that many AI approaches and the tools are uh, biased in some substantive way because of some cases, the availability of data, the mindsets of the designers, there's a lot of areas where bias can come in. Then you have this concern of equity, which I think in most campuses today is one of the driving motivators, giving all learners opportunities to be successful and leveling the playing field where people who may have historically been disadvantaged. So I think that's that sort of entangled intersection of AI's potential with the flaws of bias that designers and existing data sets bring in. And then add in the reality of equity attainment is an intentional, not an accidental activity. And that's where you can start to see some of the friction, some of the challenges arising. From the AI to support student outcomes then, which is the tail end of that uh, perspective, it's clear that there's a lot that AI can do, especially when it is intelligently or well-designed and at least bias and it's the biases that are captured in it are adequately reflected. So from an academic outcome, you know, AI can provide feedback, it can do effective tutoring work, profile development, you know, automated profile development, adaptive curriculum, personalized learning, um, recommendation engines that will recommend social connections or that will recommend learning material, learning content you might want to look at next. And it can also do a lot of work around nudging or actively directing learner or student engagement. So from that end, there's real practical academic outcomes that AI can be used to support the attainment of equity, or at least to move us in the direction of greater equity or more equitable uh, teaching and learning experience. The issue that I see, though, is, is a fairly fundamental one, because we're dealing with two types of outcomes, and uh, you know, it's somewhat intentionally vaguely worded. On the one hand, we have this outcome that is educational better grades, better performance, less time on curriculum, move through faster, get formally recognized for informal learning. That's fantastic. We want that. I think all of us want a more, uh, you know, a more efficient education system and also one that uh, provides supports for those who've traditionally not been given equal opportunities. But then we have a secondary component, which is the human outcomes. It, it's somewhat different um, than educational outcomes, and I'll explain what I mean. So much of what AI and education attempts to do is really to support a lot of decision-making process, or put another way, it deals in many instances with metacognitive or metacognitive work. And I would argue that this is actually the key aspect of the future of uh, learning. And this came through in the conversations that we were having earlier when I said, what's unique to the domain of, of you know, human activity and human work. And a lot of the things related to this idea of you know, creativity or related to 
exercising personal agency. Uh, so we feel that that is an exclusive domain of human work going forward. And yet many of the systems that we have, it actually eliminates those decisions from us. The machine decides, hey, guess what? You should learn this concept next. The machine decides, oh, this is another topic that you should be able to tackle, that you should be able to look at and so on. And so what it's essentially doing then, which is my concern, the most human attributes going forward are in some cases the one where we're meeting AI in the middle. We are sort of dumbing down, not maybe dumbing down is maybe the wrong word, but we are uh, automating our curriculum, we're structuring our resources so that we're taking out a lot of the joy and the magic and the, the humanity of our curriculum and our material. And instead, it's a series of just jumping through hoops, jumping through hoops. And there have been instances where companies have created these AI systems that end up basically confining students in front of a laptop or in front of a screen for hours and hours during the day. Uh, in many cases, robbed of a lot of that vital social interaction and social development. So I just want to emphasize that from my perspective, that's a pretty substantive concern. And it's one that gets right at the heart of equity, because I can see in some ways that school systems that are not well funded or universities that serve uh, some of the sort of the historically excluded populations, they're going to be budget and budget constrained in order to then meet the needs of educational outcomes that the state or society expects of them, they will end up having to rely on AI systems to do a lot of this work. And because they're relying on AI systems, uh, they are going to actually attack the core human attribute, which is the metacognitive structures that we need to be successful learners going forward. Students then who are well off or who come from better funded school districts and neighborhoods, uh, they're going to have better teacher to student relationships, they're still going to retain the metacognitive aspect of the learning experience, because they don't have to rely on AI to routinize that part of the curriculum. So hopefully that argument is, is coming clear from an equity lens, is that in the future are the people who are well off and traditionally advantaged and privileged, will they be the ones that will continue to have engaged human social curriculum and people who come from historically disadvantaged sections of, or school districts or regions will end up being the ones that will have heavy AI concentration, which would be fine if AI didn't attack that core human attribute, which is metacognition. And I think that in many ways is the most substantive argument that I'm trying to advance, at least in the conversation here. Final few slides. Um, so this is from another colleague, uh, Shane Dawson out of uh, University of South Australia. He's the Executive Dean of Education Futures and has done a lot of thinking around leadership and leadership in the educational technology space. And one of the arguments that he's uh, articulated, and this is based on work of other researchers uh, as well, but he's advancing from the perspective of ed tech and learning analytics and increasingly AI, is on the one hand, we have a couple of roles and responsibilities with our university systems or schools, it could, could be any system. On the one hand, we have the adaptive dynamics, right? We have this bottom up, messy, chaotic, play around, do things, be innovative. But on the flip side, if you wanna deploy something to gain institutional benefits or to ensure that you have consistent outcomes, you need to become more administrative and you need to have rules and processes in place. So put another way, if you want to transition an idea such as learning analytics or an adaptive model to scale, you need to move from this adaptive, chaotic, fuzzy space through to administrative, structured and organized. The middle space there is the uh, is where the tensions exist. And that's essentially the domain of leadership. Um, there's a there's a Spark framework, I think it's sparkframework.net, I'll dig it up after I'm done chatting, that we've done workshops with the Learning Analytics Summer Institute for Solar for the last several years and are planning for next year as well. But it's a leadership framework for deploying learning analytics because the reality is you manage technical systems in a different way than you manage social systems. When you wanna scale work in a technical system, it's pretty easy. You just scale and throw more money at the problems, buy bigger technology, buy more bandwidth, buy whatever. When you scale up social systems though, you have to move through exactly this model here, which is you move from this adaptive flexible space to some level of tension and creative negotiation with in, in order to have that administrative and final concluding output. So I just wanna list that as in the background of everything that relates to equity, everything that relates to AI is the role of leadership in helping to make things like equity and in institutional language or things like equity embedded deeply in curricular decisions.
Two final slides. One, um, for those of you that are interested, uh, we have uh, an open online conference. This is a free conference uh, for anyone to sign up for. It's empoweringlearners.ai. So uh, if you want to drop a link in there, that'd be fantastic. Uh, so you're welcome to join. It's a global conference. Um, it's being coordinated with a group uh, from really from around the world. We've got representation from, from the US, um, Europe, and Australia in coordinating the event. So uh, you'll find much of the conferences in friendly North American time zone starting in the afternoon and running into the evening. And then finally, for those of you that are interested in doing a deeper dive in learning analytics, Justin and I are both uh, involved in the Master of Science in Learning Analytics at uh, UTA, and uh, we're just rolling out our uh, upcoming um, uh, sort of uh, cohort uh, starting in January. So on that note, I think we've got about five minutes left. So we do have uh, open-ended question time and I'll throw it over to Robert. Yeah, and uh, we've got one here in the, the chat from Leif Nelson. Uh, do we categor categorically want more efficient education or are some elements of education deliberate, thoughtful, discursive, perhaps even slow and entail a healthy form of struggle and growth? Well, I would like to suggest the question was answered <laughs> within the question. Um, I think all of us want that. I think there's things that we want to be more efficient, which is the boring administrative kinds of behind the scenes stuff. But, you know, the process of human development is very much a rich, engaging, slow, thoughtful, deliberate process. So, yes, uh, I don't think we want the whole of education system to be made efficient, uh, even though I think many of us feel that there is a substantial shift occurring in uh, certainly in universities and schools that are uh, stripping away some of that slow deliberative discursive work and i'll once again return to my other argument which is i believe these systems that will be most impacted by the push to efficiencies are actually ones that uh, are traditionally disadvantaged and i think that's that's a really a significant open-ended concern for me Thank you. Anybody in the chat, feel free to type your question, raise uh, your hand or turn on your camera to let us know. In the meantime, I'd be curious to know, George, do you feel like the, where the policy winds are blowing on, on this question? Do you, do you think that policy at the state or federal level is an important factor at the present time, or is there sort of big things coming, or do you think there's sort of still a lack of appreciation for this work so that policymakers haven't really gotten too involved in, in shaping rules and regulations? Well, if what happened with social media and Facebook is any indication, uh, they had a 20 year runway, uh, the big tech firms did anyway, 15 to 20 year runway before uh, you know, policymakers significantly turned their attention to it. Uh, and especially in the US, and we, we've seen over the last few years, the big tech companies uh, testifying before Congress to try and you know, understand what is it that you guys are doing and why is it that you're contributing to a very divisive country? And how is it that you're letting misinformation and disinformation spread? So um, I'm gonna be a cynic here and I will say that until we have a change in leadership that is more reflective of the prominent trends in population, namely uh, more technologically savvy, uh, more youthful uh, experiences, I think we're, we're going to keep seeing this policy delay to the tune of a decade plus around core issues that impact uh, the use of AI, especially in learning settings. Uh, one of the views I had, I'm going to briefly rant and then I'll be better, but one of the, the um, challenges that many of us faced was the best time for universities to pay attention to digital learning was well in the year 2000. And many universities didn't substantively engage with it until COVID hit. They you know, had maybe small departments or they had, you know, a few uh, services available, but broadly their view of digital learning was quite limited. Then all of a sudden we had this massive change. Then we had terrible deployment because we're all panicked to get on the digital settings. And all, all of a sudden we had negative experience for students, bad outcomes, and the list goes on. So that's where my concern is that with AI, we're going to wait and wait and wait. There won't be a vision developed either at a university level or a societal level. And we'll have uh, this same kind of horrific catch up when a crisis moment hits, which will then favor organizations who've developed that infrastructure and universities will need to buy those services rather than growing that capability internally. 
Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Thank you, Justin. Uh, in the meantime, uh, they are there to serve as a resource for all of you. Thank you for attending to today's session and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again for being a part of it. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.